due to the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission in Montgomery County Parks. Uh, we serve a county of just a little over a million uh, residents. It's a county that's very diverse in terms of uh, its population, in terms of income and, and many other and race and many other demographics. Uh, it's also a county that is uh, is is urban, uh, suburban, and rural. Uh, big big parts of the county and populations uh, are in those. Uh, categories. We have, uh, we manage 37,000 acres of parkland, so it's a big system, and we um, manage 419 individual parks, ranging from little tiny urban pocket parks all the way up to uh, our 3,000 acre Little Bennett uh, Regional Park, which is a, primarily a conservation park. Um, we're a bi-county agency. Uh, it's chartered by the state of Maryland. We, our origins go back to 1927, so we're pretty unique, but uh, the commission itself serves both Montgomery and Prince George's County. Uh, that would be of just about 2 million residents, but uh, over here we're just uh, working on the uh, Montgomery side. A few housekeeping notes. Uh, the session is going to be recorded and posted through our website for future viewing. We'll have a Q&A session immediately following the presentation. And during the presentation, at any time, you can submit your questions via the Q&A box uh, throughout the session. So the title today uh, is What a Pickle, Balancing Demand for Pickleball and Tennis in Parks. Uh, one of the words we use more frequently in Montgomery Parks is repurposing parkland because uh, we're, we're kind of slowing down in our ability to uh, acquire raw parkland. So when there's emerging trends, you have to look across the system. And sometimes you say you have to repurpose something that has been something for a long time into something else. And whenever you do that, of course, it causes tension because people, if it, they've had something for a long time, they view that repurposing as taking away. So there are, this is, and this is not unique to pickleball. This is unique to dog parks, community gardens, other trending amenities we're trying to get into the system. So without further ado, let me introduce our esteemed panelists today. Uh, we have Alex Kerman. He is the Director of Business Operations and Research for the Sports and Fitness Industry Association. He leads the association's signature research efforts, including the Physical Activity Council, survey measuring sports participation rates in the United States. He also directs the association Startup Challenge, an event that highlights the latest innovation in sports and fitness, and the Soccer Industry Council of, of America, and the Pickleball Council, two groups that create a forum to tackle industry challenges and work uh, to better their sport. So thank you, Alex, for joining us today. We also have David Robinson. He's the director of racket sports for the Little Falls Swim and Racket Club in Bethesda, Maryland. He's vice president of the board of directors of the U.S. Professional Tennis Association Mid-Atlantic. And he served as the tennis and pickleball representatives on Montgomery Parks Sport Court Working Group uh, in the period between 2018 and 2019 that included the agency's 2019 uh, pickleball. And rounding out our panel is Stacy West, who is a principal parks planner for the city of Denver, Colorado, a Department of Parks and Recreation. I have to put out a footnote that the director of Parks and Recreation uh, goes by the name of Happy Haynes, someone I met years ago. And you can't ask for a better name for a park and rec, rec director than Happy. Uh, prior to that, Stacy worked in Washington, D.C. for a public-private partnership. Uh, incorporated to plan, design, and build a network of new parks and public space to a rapidly developing area of D.C. and as a community planner for D.C. Department of Parks and Recreation. So Stacy is very familiar with our geography here in the uh, DMV area. So I'm going to turn it over to uh, next to Chuck Kynes. Chuck Kynes is uh, one of a member of our park planning and stewardship team who was giving the very important task many years ago of being our pickle, pickleball guru and figuring out how we're gonna go from uh, zero to 100 in a relatively short period of time. So I wanna thank him for doing a good job with that. And Chuck, the floor is all yours. Great, thank you, Mike. Uh, my name is Chuck Kynes again. I am a park planner with 
uh, our long range planning section in park planning and stewardship. Among the many hats that I wear, I am the pickleball coordinator for Montgomery Parks. And I am uh, speaking today to sort of set the stage for the rest of our panel, uh, sort of answering the question, why are we here? Pickleball is one of the fastest growing sports in the US and uh, here in Montgomery County as well. Uh, it has been perceived for a long time as a game for seniors, but what we're seeing here in Montgomery County, Maryland, and I'm sure is a, is happening elsewhere in the county in the country, is that it's growing rapidly also among children, teens, and young adults. The man per courts is exploding and was accelerated during the pandemic when a lot of the indoor spaces were closed and people were looking for socially distant uh, distancing. Uh, experiences uh, that were social uh, and pickleball uh, fit the bill. Uh, it really took off during the pandemic. Uh, so one of the things I want to point out on this slide is the map at the bottom. Montgomery County Public Schools, our, our local school system, uh, added pickleball courts to nearly all of its middle schools uh, in 20 and 21. And I just learned recently uh, from David Robinson, one of our panelists, that uh, the high schools will be soon adding uh, pickleball as a varsity sport uh, at all its high schools. So a lot of the tennis courts at high schools in Montgomery County will also soon have uh, pickleball overlays on its tennis courts. So as Mike mentioned, back in 2018, 2019, uh, our agency put together a sports court working group. And the reason for that was we had some emerging trends, pickleball and futsal, also known as uh, court soccer, uh, and we had a large supply of tennis courts. Many were underutilized. The challenge was uh, tennis was continuing to grow at a slower rate, but continuing to grow. Uh, but pickleball was sort of exploding, and uh, there was a lot of demand for futsal and court soccer as well. So the charge was, how can we add uses to existing tennis courts or basketball courts, meaning shared use, or better yet, for you know, the, the new players, uh, how could we convert or repurpose existing tennis courts or basketball courts uh, to other uses? So we put together a site suitability study uh, for pickleball and uh, futsal. And I'm gonna describe uh, the pickleball side on the next slide. So this is Bauer Drive uh, um, Local Park in Aspen Hill, Rockville area of Montgomery County. Uh, this I'm choosing this one as a as a, an example to share because uh, it really met all the criteria that we put together. Uh, so when we put pickleball in parks, local parks, uh, we try to do it in uh, places where there's sufficient sufficient distance from existing homes, a place that has adequate parking. We assume, or I assume, uh, every pickleball player is driving alone. Uh, so if there are uh, uh, at, at Bower Drive, there are six pickleball courts. That means at any given time, there's 24 people playing there. Uh, so we need at least 24 spaces, plus all the people waiting. Uh, we strive to achieve ADA accessibility for all our park facilities, but particularly pickleball, because there is a growing community of pickleball players who uh, are playing in wheelchairs. Uh, we look for a place with existing lighting, good road and highway access, Good transit access would be highly desirable and compatible with other nearby park uses. So what we did at uh, Bower Drive is uh, we chose that site because if you can see in the bottom right photo, it's adjacent to Wood Middle School, which has its own tennis courts. So the, when we converted the tennis courts at Bower Drive to pickleball courts, this community was still well served uh, by tennis courts. There are four ways to implement pickleball courts in Montgomery County, or four ways that we do it. Uh, we add temporary lines on existing courts, uh, tennis courts. We either tape it or add chalk. Um, we also um, add permanent lines on existing tennis courts. We first ex uh, experimented with yellow, but eventually settled on blue, light blue. Uh, we convert tennis courts to uh, pickleball courts. We either convert one, uh, which is the example uh, at 3.2 uh, 
uh, or convert both, uh, which is what we did at Bower Dry 3.1, or we leave one, uh, the photo at the bottom right, uh, 3.2, which is Seven Locks Local Park in Potomac. Or we build purpose-built pickleball courts, which we have not done yet, but we soon will. So this is the current inventory of pickleball courts in Montgomery County. As Mike said, in 2018, we only had one location with pickleball courts at Olney Mill Neighborhood Park. We now have 86 pickleball courts shared with tennis. We have eight dedicated pickleball courts uh, at Bower Drive and Seven Locks. Uh, and planned uh, this year and beyond, we'll have soon have 20 dedicated pickleball courts and 10 uh, more pickleball courts shared with tennis. I just want to put a shout out or give a shout out to MoCo Pickleball, Rob Campbell, uh, in particular, who I coordinate very closely with uh, for pickleball implementation. Uh, they're very uh, engaged in uh, helping us uh, figure out where to put new pickleball and to uh, resolve some of the issues that we're going to talk about today. So the last slide I have today is just to, to set the stage for what I'm hoping will be an engaging discussion with our panel and also with the people attending uh, the issues that Montgomery County is grappling with, with pickleball and tennis. Uh, the issue of shared use versus dedicated or purpose-built, guaranteed play opportunities, which means uh, dedicated courts for pickleball, uh, so that, you know, when pickleball players travel a long distance to play uh, pickleball, uh, dedicated courts provide that guaranteed play opportunity, but shared tennis courts do not. I, I want to talk about noise and neighborhood impacts. Uh, th that is the issue, and that's why I have it in color here. That is probably the issue around the country right now, uh, communities dealing with noise and impacts to communities. Lighting and hours of use, uh, you know, allowing people to play at night, particularly in the wintertime when, at least here in D.C., uh, it's dark at five o'clock. Um, and, you know, people are still looking for opportunities to play in the evening. Um, adequate parking, dealing with user conflicts, making sure that our courts and experiences uh, address the needs of people with disabilities. And then one of the things that I've learned in my short time dealing with pickleball uh, here in Montgomery County is bathrooms and Porta Johns are very important because pickleball players like to play for uh, several hour, hours at a time. And you can only do that when you have bathrooms nearby. So with that, I am going to hand it off to Alex Kerman, who will talk about industry trends and research. Thanks, Chuck. Thanks, Mike. Uh, hey, everyone. Excited to be here. Again, I'm Alex Kerman. I'm the Director of Business Operations and Research for the Sports and Fitness Industry Association, or, or SFIA. Um, for those of you that don't know SFIA, SFIA is the premier trade association for the industry. We represent uh, over 700 brands. Um, next slide. Um, and today I'm going to speak about what's happening with pickleball trends nationally. Um, before getting into the specific data, uh, just kind of a little background on where we get our data from. So um, our participation data is SFI partners with a bunch of other organizations. As you can see, their, their logo is there on the bottom to create the largest participation survey in the US. Uh, we have 18,000 annual respondents ages six or older. Um, overall, we track 124 different sports and activities. Um, and SFI has been tracking participation rates for, 40, for over 40 years. Um, next slide. Um, so, now, uh, whoop, uh, perfect. Um, now getting into data, um, as you can see here, pickleball is the fastest growing sport um, in the U.S. Um, it's grown an astonishing 158.6% since 2019. Um, it is uh, significantly higher than any of the other sports or activities that we track. Um, and, you know, the common theme in terms of what we saw, why all these sports grew, especially during the, the pandemic time was you could play them outdoors, socially distanced, um, or individually or with, with a limited number of people, which pretty much every sport on this, on this list highlights. Um, another sport I just wanted to highlight from the list is tennis. Tennis is the seventh fastest growing sport in the U.S. Uh, at 33.4%. Um, it's truly remarkable that tennis is that high. Tennis is about uh, two and a half times bigger than pickleball in terms of total participants. There's 23.6 million people that play tennis. 
Um, and typically the sports that are higher uh, have a lower participation rate because if they have a, a little bit of an influx, the percentages will jump. So for tennis to be number seven, it, it's pretty impressive. Um, and actually we uh, are saying at SFI, it, it's kind of 2022 has been the year of racket sports. Uh, every single racket sport that we track uh, increased participation. So some of the other ones would be racquetball, badminton, squash, um, obviously pickleball, tennis, cardio tennis, and a couple other ones. So uh, overall, racket sports participation grew by 10 million people. There's just over 50 million people playing racket sports in the U.S. in 2022. And, and in 2019, or, or pre-pandemic, that was just under 40 million. So uh, a pretty big increase there. Um, next slide. Um Looking at pickleball participation, so right now there are 8.9 million people playing pickleball. Uh, that's in 2022. That's an 85% growth from 2021, uh, which the number was at 4.8 million. Uh, just a little background in terms of us tracking pickleball. We've been tracking pickleball participation since 2014. It's grown every single year since we've been tracking it. But as you can see from the chart, it's really exploded in 2020, and, and it's really taken off kind of the last year and a half. So um, next slide. Um, going into why pickleball grew, um, so uh, there are a number of different factors that kind of contribute to this. So the first one in that top left corner is it's really easy to set up a court. You can set up a court in a gym, in a driveway, uh, you know, on the street, in a park, you know, on a tennis court. So uh, that just increases accessibility and the easier uh, participants have to access, you know, the, the court and to play in a court, the more likely they are to play. So, so that was a big deal in terms of, of helping the sport grow. Um, the second picture in the bottom left is there's increased infrastructure, which, which I know we're, we're talking about here. Um, there has been increased infrastructure. There still needs to be an increased infrastructure for pickleball. Um, but that definitely helped and, and dedicated courts provide players a better play experience, which attracts more players. Uh, the more courts that get built, it also alleviates pressure on other courts and, and overcrowding facilities and, and obviously decreased uh, waiting time. So, uh, you know, infrastructure is, is a really big way to, to grow the sport. And I know that there's a number of, of facilities being built right now. Um, the next thing is the national media attention that we're getting. That's the top right picture. So with celebrities and just in the news, um, you know, it seems like every week there's an article coming out in terms of a new pickleball facility or some talking about how how fast uh, pickleball is growing. Um, we also look at the three pickleball professional leagues, the MLP, APP, and PPA. All of them have signed this past year national television deals with ESPN, CBS Sports, Tennis Channel, um, and others. So all of that is putting, you know, the sport into more households and, and, and enticing people uh, to play more. And then also you have celebrities in, in endorsing and investing uh, in this sport. You know, Stephen Colbert on CBS Sports, they hosted a celebrity pickleball tournament. Uh, you know, Tom Brady, Naomi Osaka, Patrick Mahomes, and, and, and numerous others have invested in the sport. So again, it just, just increases the awareness for it. Um, and lastly, on this slide, which, which kind of relates to, to the my previous slide is pickleball can be played outdoor, you know, socially distance, recreationally, and, and um, you know, those, those are the sports that, that grew the last few years. Um, next slide. Um, the number one reason why pickleball grew is it's easy to play, it's easy to pick up, and it's easy to enjoy quickly. Um, the faster a participant can enjoy the sport, the more likely they are to return, the more likely they are to recommend the sport to somebody else. And, um, you know, every sport tries to achieve this, and, and pickleball is doing a great job of, of, of doing that. Um, next slide. So obviously with extreme growth come some challenges. Um, I know a couple of, of my other co-panelists are going to dive into them a little bit more. So I'll just highlight a couple of key ones. Um, and then, uh, I'll, I'll kind of let them take over. So the first one, which Chuck mentioned is the noise, you know, we've heard and seen in the media, a bunch of stories with HOAs and, and residents, you know, being bothered by the noise pickleball can, can be a loud sport. So, um, like I said, I know they're talking about guidelines in terms of where to build courts and, and stuff like that. So that's definitely a, a challenge that the sport's going through. Um, the second one in, in that bottom left is, you know, the battle for court space or the pickleball v tennis. You know, you can have pickleball players taking over tennis courts or tennis players taking over or tennis players playing and pickleball players not having um, a place to play on, on the tennis courts because there's no pickleball courts. So uh, I just want to note, too, this does happen for other sports. If you take, say, like a football field. You could play football on that. You can play soccer. You can play lacrosse. You can play other sports. Typically, the play patterns determine, you know, what sport is playing on that that field or, or court. 
Uh, but due to the extreme growth of pickleball, we haven't seen those play patterns play out yet. So I do think that this will alleviate kind of over time uh, once we kind of figure out the play patterns for both tennis and pickleball and obviously increased infrastructure will help too. Um, another issue that that we've seen come up is United Healthcare uh, just came out with a study that there's going to be an additional 250 to 500 million dollars uh, in medical injuries that can be directly attributed to pickleball. So injuries, obviously, um, an issue for a lot of sports, and, and and that was that was a pretty big number to to highlight. So, um, next slide. Um, diving into the data a little bit more. So this is pickleball participation by age group. Um, pickleball truly is a multi-generational sport. You rarely see this, um, if, uh, in other sports, if I was to give you the same chart for any of the other, you know, 124 sports that we, we track, typically they'd be skewed to certain age groups and, and there'd be a big drop off somewhere. Um, as you can clearly see here, there's not that big of a drop off, which, which is truly incredible and, and, and speaks to the growth and, and popularity for the sport. Um, the most participated age group is a 25 to, to 34 category, uh, sorry, 24 to 34 category, uh, 1.5 million. The second most is 18 to 24 and 65 plus at 1.4 million. And, and again, it just highlights, you know, 18 to, to 24 and 65 plus, you know, having the same participation rate is 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 rare. And it's something uh, that's great that it's, it's multi-generational and pickleball can be a lifetime sport um, or is a lifetime sport. Um, next slide. Um, so then looking at pickleball participation by region. So the South Atlantic region, which is that orange slide, the orange, orange line in the top there is the most participated region. Um, we use the same regions as the census. So Maryland is in the South Atlantic region. The South Atlantic region comprises of Maryland basically down the coastline to Florida. Um, and again, just kind of analyzing this, uh, even though they, each region has different participation levels, they're following the same trend line, which which is rare. Um, usually you'd see a sport gain popularity in, in a couple regions, one, two, maybe three regions, and the other regions will follow. Um, this, it's kind of every region is following the same trajectory, which again is just speaking to the extreme growth that, that the sport's seen. Um, next slide. So my last couple slides here are talking about court and facility data. Um, this is not SFI data. This is Pickle, Pickleheads data, which is a company that SFI partnered with. We just released a new uh, report it's called State of Pickleball Participation Infrastructure Report. So I just thought a couple of these data points would be relevant to, to the conversation here. So in terms of uh, how many facilities they are in the U.S., there's just over 12,000 pickleball facilities in the U.S., just under 52,000 courts, which is, is about 4.3 courts per uh, facility. Um, I should say, too, that this is taken from June 2023, so I know there's already been more courts built, but this is from the report. It was taking courts from June 2023. Um, next slide. Um, most of the courts here are temporary. 71% um, of the courts are temporary, 29% are dedicated, and again, just highlighting the, the fact earlier where dedicated courts just provide a better play experience um, and uh, there are more and more dedicated facilities being built across the country. And once that kind of comes in, uh, we expect to see this. We're going to this is an annual report that we're going to create and, and tracking it. We do expect to see the dedicated court number rise, um, which I think will help alleviate all, all, all some of the issues right now that the sport's facing. Um, next slide. Um, and lastly, kind of the conclusion from our, our report was uh, the U.S. needs to spend 900 million on courts over the next five to seven years to create just under 26,000. So, so basically the supply can meet demand. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions at the end, but I will pass it back to Chuck. Great. Thanks, Alex. Now I'm going to hand it off to David Robinson, who's going to talk about uh, his experience on the Sport Court Working Group, but also uh, his experience uh, working with other jurisdictions in the Washington, D.C. area. Chuck, and nice to talk to you again, Alex. Um, can everybody hear me okay? I need my, it sees my video needs to be started, I believe. If you want me, that is. Maybe I sound better than I look, but uh, it looks like the host is, okay. Point on to the slides then. Um, so I was introduced to the sport court work group in the county, uh, having been a 44-year uh, professional tennis player and manager of facilities. So uh, essentially, I came into the work group as part of the 
the tennis contingency group to basically do battle with pickleball and protect the tennis court from being repurposed and re and shared and so on. And through the course of that, uh, good video. There we go. Thank you. Um, I learned a lot. I was very impressed with the process that Montgomery Parks goes through. Uh, it's a very serious process. As we know, it's a time consuming process. We're trying to get it right. But as I went through this and and learned more and more about pickleball, I was one of a very large and growing group of uh, tennis professionals uh, that are pro pickleball. And I've kind of come to this little analogy that uh, pickleball is a little bit like a, a relative of tennis. It's kind of a noisy relative and it needs housing temporarily until we can find a, a better place for them to, to play the game. Uh, next slide, please. There we go, thank you. So this is the slide I use in a lot of my presentations uh, and in my consulting with facilities and municipalities and resorts. And so we sort of look at the situation. This is a formerly a SWOT analysis that I've sort of rebranded into supply and demand, which we know that the supply is not meeting the demand. And then we look at how do we make the correction for that. And so we go down to the, this available space and the budget. Those are the two parts of that. So available open space, converted, repurposed space and shared use spaces are the three categories that are worked with. Now, the budget, as you'll see here, the blended lines that you see a lot of are very inexpensive, under $500. However, repurposing, which means resurfacing, putting a new coat of acrylic paint, moving the net posts and turning them into pickleball courts that were once tennis or even basketball or some other asphalt surface is about $5,000 as opposed to new builds where we get up to about $35,000. So it's been a slow, painful process trying to get the, uh, uh, the supply to meet the demand, but these are our issues. If you look at the demand part, one of the keys in when I'm talking with uh, facility operators, municipalities, is peak versus average. You can say that the utilization rate is low, but in fact, it's the peak utilization that sort of dictates whether uh, this is a underutilized or, or not facility. So one example is uh, at a 24% utilization rate, but there was a period where they do leagues and teams, tennis teams and leagues, and uh, they did not have enough courts. So this is part of how you need to look at that. When they say underutilized court, we need to define really, is it an average or is it, what do we need for the things that we do once or twice a week, once a month, et cetera, or do we reformat how we do that so that it can accommodate uh, more players with fewer resource? Uh, next slide, please. So it came down to this. Um, how do we want to do this? Now we can put one, two, I've seen three, I've seen four pickleball courts in, out of one tennis court. So the question is total courts versus available courts. You can have a lot of courts, but they're not available. It doesn't really do the the, the common user, a lot of good if they're just waiting around and they can barely play an hour. So having a lot of courts is important. But when we take a tennis court out of inventory or pickleball, uh, by repurposing it, you're able to get a lot more people, as you can see on the right side of this uh, uh, slide, playing at the same time. So if we were to do the center image where we put a two-on-one shared, which is sort of the spec that's been widely adopted, and I'll get into that in a little bit more because this came directly from uh, the sport court work group meetings. Uh, we can share the court. And then how do you get the, the highest utilization out of that is usually occurring through some sort of uh, programmatic partitioning where it's used for pickleball this time and tennis for that. And there's a lot to be ironed out of that. There's a lot of rubs, especially in unmanaged walk-on type facilities. But the facilities that do reservations are able to manage this very, very effectively. So that might be one direction Montgomery Parks could eventually work online. And then finally, you get the simple tennis court. So the two to four tennis players showing up to play tennis on a where there's eight to 16 people that want to play pickleball feel a little outnumbered. So I know that they've been intimidated and uh, that has been an issue, but let's not forget a couple of years ago, it was the pickleball players that were getting pushed around. Uh, next slide, please. So this is uh, from the work group and what we came up with, I'm kind of happy to say this was one of my uh, original designs with uh, Mark Wallace, who was Chuck Kine's predecessor here. And uh, 
we had a dilemma there is if we're going to go to blended lines and share two on one, what about the nets? So portable pickleball nets are, the problem is they can be stolen. They can be vandalized. They're good outdoor 24 seven or fairly expensive. We don't want to force the users to bring nets, but on the other hand, uh, unsecured facilities leaving out, you know, a, a 500 to $1,300 per net is very risky. So some places have done it and they haven't had the vandalism, theft, the attrition on that. It's been working out. So what we did here is we moved the uh, pickleball baselines that are closest to the tennis net. We moved it seven feet from the tennis net, which is the distance for a pickleball kitchen. For those of you that play pickleball, that's the distance. And then we connected the sidelines of pickleball A and pickleball B under the tennis net. And what that did was that created the ability to have a regulation pickleball court across a tennis net. Now, what you do is you slide the tennis net center strap over diagonally till the net lowers to 32 inches. The tennis net is 36. So that's an easy way just to lower the net quickly. You don't have to cinch up the strap. You just move it, move it over. And, uh, and then if you have the nets, or you bring the nets, or you're leaving them out and putting them back, you have the two courts on top of one court. And so you're able to get that better utilization. Uh, but anyway, this is one of the outcomes from the sport court work group. It's been adopted for MCPS as well as parks, Fairfax County Parks, Fairfax schools are also doing this exact same uh, shared court design for the same reasons. And next slide, please. So as we get into this, there is definitely going to be a category of courts that will be permanently shared forever. School courts are probably the best example. Now, what I do is I run after school tennis and pickleball programs for about a dozen of the MCPS elementary and middle schools. So the bottom right is Wesleyan Middle School, one of my schools, and they were one of the first to get the, the, the new blend. And uh, we're also using those for short court tennis. So if you've seen red ball tennis where they played that on a 36 court or a 60 foot court, we're able to use the 44 foot pickleball court very effectively for short tennis. So it definitely has uh, a place for youth tennis. And then again, it's going down to programmatically partitioning what's going on uh, when in each facility. So if we're gonna have a permanent court, if you look behind that uh, baseline on the bottom right, it changes from blue to green. Now that makes kind of a weird pickleball court, but if you go up right above it on a single color surface, which used to be very common, actually the norm for, for decades and decades till about 20 years ago, it doesn't change up and it's a pretty uh, neutral for tennis versus pickleball use. And to the uh, left and up and down are, are a situation where uh, some creative facilities have decided to extend the the interior blue tennis court to behind the tennis line. And you now have a single color uh, pickleball court that's shared with tennis. And it doesn't seem to bother the tennis players. And when I say no yellow lines on that bottom uh, inset, this was a kind of a decision we came to. Another work group was formed, which I was happy to serve on. And that was the US Tennis Association and USA Pickleball. And the goal of this work group was to come up with guidelines and best practices, and support for courts that would be shared with, with tennis and pickleball. And one of the most common mistakes we saw going around the county, besides turning the uh, pickleball courts east and west perpendicular to the tennis nets, putting the sun in some people's eyes, was the use of yellow lines. And the problem with the yellow line is your pickleball and your tennis balls are generally yellow. So you need a contrast color. Otherwise, when the ball strikes the line, it makes it very difficult to make line calls or to make a play ball hitting the line it sort of blends in and the, the lines are good that means you have to play the ball if it hits the line so that's something that we came up with that's in the published guidelines nationally to to avoid using uh colors for the lines that would make it uh, that are too close to the ball color in the color wheel uh, next slide please so here's a great example this is montgomery county it's a private public partnership it's the montgomery tennis plex out at the uh, regional South Germantown Regional Park, where they have a soccer plex. So it's everything there, the, the aquatic centers there. And that has been there for about 20 years now. And it was a tennis uh, private public partnership. Uh, I brought a little investor group in there that was willing to put up a few million bucks to uh, build indoor pickleball there. And we had several meetings and uh, they had this track with a new bubble, as you can see. 
that had been not been built on. That is brand new. There was nothing but grass there for quite a while. And so that we proposed where we put the indoor 16 indoor permanent pickleball courts. Uh, they came back and said, well, we'd like the outdoor courts you, you could use, but we want to build our new tennis courts there. And it was part of the contract in the lease, in the public private partnership lease. And, uh, and then after that, they came back and decided they just wanted to do it all on themselves. And obviously they thought it was a good business model for them. And they now have uh, 10 indoor tennis, four outdoor lighted, 18 pickleball courts, six are dedicated, four blended indoor and eight are outdoor. So to have a national level event, you're supposed to have 16 pickleball courts or more. Now they could have just continued blending two on one, like you saw on the previous slide, until they had 32 pickleball courts, which have been their maximum number with a blended design. But what's changed, uh, I think we're at a tipping point right now in the evolution and the relationship between tennis and pickleball. And the first part is the discerning pickleball player is not just happy to be on a blended court anymore. They want dedicated courts that feel better, that have their groups, and it's a, and it's a bigger number. So that was one reason the Montgomery Tennis Plex and, and Plex Pickleball decided to uh, have some permanent in, uh, indoor pickleball courts. The second tipping point, and I think this is where the SFIA needs to start tracking, I've mentioned it in as many words, is crossover participation. Then we know certain groups of people play this and that, you know, like skiing and golf, but we need to know where the tennis player playing pickleball and the pickleball player that's coming to tennis kind of the trends on, on that. And what I'm seeing from just being out there with all my tennis players is I'm seeing a very high rate of tennis players participating in pickleball on the side. Doesn't mean they're quitting pickleball because tennis is too hard. It means they're also playing pickleball. And they're doing this. My advanced group tennis players will play, end up playing pickleball because A, they can walk out there the first time and be a pretty solid player. And B, they have friends and family they want a social sport with that they wouldn't be able to have a good game of tennis, but the pickleball is sort of a neutralizer of skill levels. Then we're also seeing some of the, you know, tennis players that just aren't very good tennis players that are feeling that their competency level in pickleball is easier. Pickleball is a very easy sport to start with, and it's actually a nice progression into tennis. And we're trying that in the uh, school systems where they start. As a matter of fact, there are school systems that use pickleball and PE, and then the next uh, PE season, tennis is introduced. So it is a, call it a gateway sport to tennis. At least that's what I've been trying to tell the U.S. Tennis Association. Uh, next slide, please. So this is the in, what they did inside of the Montgomery uh, Tennis Plex building their pickle plex is they took two of the tennis courts and converted them to six pickleball. They retained two of the tennis court to put the blend in. So they have 10 there. I think you'll see quite a bit of this in the facilities that have both tennis and pickleball. Uh, you'll have your primary pickleball courts, and then you'll have these tennis courts that can be used for pickleball, like for warm-ups in a real tournament or, you know, for additional when you're having larger events. And I think that's a great design. I think there's the best future of facilities is going to be mixed racket and paddle sports, including the sport of Padel, P-A-D-E-L, which is the world's fastest growing sport. Um, and I think the reason behind that is you'll be able to have a hub sort of effect where somewhat like the skiing and the snowboarding community have sort of come together one side of the mountains for this and the other side of the mountains for that, but they share the operational uh, costs, the maintenance, uh, they drive revenues from combined streams in their, in their lodging in that case, as well as food and beverage, uh, retail, et cetera. And it makes a stronger business model, which in turn makes it easier to, to, to grow the facility itself where they can. That's basically my presentation. You got about 170 more slides we don't have time for, but I'm happy to take some questions at the end of the at the end of the whole presentation. But I want to just leave you with this little mathematical theory. If enough tennis players also played pickleball, we wouldn't have a supply demand problem. How what that number is, I don't know. But it, as you play more pickleball, and I'm seeing a lot of tennis players picking it up, and a lot of the pickleball instructors in this country, by the way, they are certified generally by the two tennis associations of added pickleball certification. So tennis and pickleball is part of the same family. And now it's just a matter of getting this family to uh, live happily ever after together and 
support each other and, and uh, cross support. Uh, I want to thank everybody very much and I'll turn it back to uh, Chuck. Thank you. Great, thank you, David. Uh, unfortunately, Carl Schmitz with the USA Pickleball Association is not able to join us today. He apologizes profusely. He uh, had his uh, uh, laptop and perhaps even his phone uh, stolen while he was uh, traveling. Uh, so he is no longer able to join us. So with that, I am going to move on to Stacy West, who is going to be talking about the experience of pickleball and tennis in Denver, Colorado. Great. Thanks, Chuck. And hi, everyone. Um, I am a parts planner um, here in Denver, um, so it's still morning for us here. Um, and it's really nice to see some familiar names and faces um, attending today. Um, I did used to work in Washington, D.C., and I can tell you that um, it's wild to me to see how fast that pickleball has grown everywhere. Um, even when I look back at in D.C., my time at D.C. Parks and Recreation, that was not really a huge consideration outside of some small programs, and now um, the demand for outdoor courts is pretty large there as well. Um, so just a little bit about Denver for those that don't know much about us. Um, we are a city of over about 700,000 people um, in a metro area that's just under 3 million people. Uh, and as you might imagine, with our uh, reported 300 days of sunshine a year, people really love to be outside here. So we do offer some indoor pickleball, but really the demand um, is in our outdoor courts. Uh, leading up to and during the pandemic, Denver was also um, growing in population. Uh, that's true of all of Colorado and the other front range communities. So we're seeing increased pressure on our parks um, to provide for more people. Um, we're also seeing neighborhoods that historically have not had much investment in parks um, or some new neighborhoods that haven't had any parks yet. So we're trying to balance um, both the growth of particular sports as well as just general population growth. Um, next slide, please. Uh, I will not read this whole slide to you, but um, just to tell you that in context, most of our outdoor pickleball courts were conversions from tennis courts. Um, I think the other panelists have kind of talked about the, the spacing and how that works, but um, we are now moving toward constructing dedicated pickleball courts. Um, that's more uh, a response to the, both the uh, growth of tennis and pickleball. Um, as an example, uh, we know that the news is all about pickleball, but Denver is uh, number one in U.S. Tennis Association league play three of the last four years. Um, it continues to grow here, and uh, it may look emptier because you can fit two people on a tennis court and the same size as 16 people on a pickleball court um, and still be fully playing, but um, it, it is still growing. Uh, we, I think our direction will be, and, and I'll talk about this in a moment, is that we'll be looking to do more of those dedicated courts um, instead of dual striping or conversions. Uh, one thing to note too about Denver is that um, just before the pandemic, uh, Denverites voted for a special tax um, it was a sales tax percentage, and that helps fund the acquisition of new parkland as well as the construction of new park facilities. Um, so that is a help to growing our system, but there was already a backlog of deferred maintenance and um, planning efforts for new parks that um, have not been built yet. So we're really trying to work on, um, you know, managing something that understandably people are really excited about with communities who have existing plans and um, may not even meet our base level of service, which is a 10 minute walk or roll to a park. Um, and just on that note, we I had seen one of the questions in the Q&A. We don't have a level of service for tennis or pickleball. On average, though, our, um, with these new courts that are coming, we're keeping up with about the national trend of number of pickleball courts uh, in proportion to the number of tennis courts. So our um, numbers kind of reflect the player counts and participation nationally. Uh, next slide, please. Um, you may have heard of us and some of our antics here in Denver. I This is wild to me that this is also um, such news making um, in the parks and recreation world, but um, you know, even with our existing courts and more on the way we make headlines, we were especially surprised um, and the uh, people here were walking around saying, oh my gosh, we're in the Washington Post. This is wild, like for a very local issue. Um, what we're finding though is uh, 
that this is true nationally, right? The, we're no exception. Um, but I did want to note that uh, the story in the upper left-hand corner, um, he was not actually charged with a felony. Um, so we do discourage people from permanently marking our courts, but there was no uh, felony charge brought to that. Um, what I think this all sort of means, though, is that um, there's a number of issues and there are really sort of uh, several ways of looking at the challenge of pickleball um, and the challenge of pickleball related to tennis as well. Um, from the player's perspective, I think the biggest issue in Denver and in Colorado and probably the rest of the U.S. is there just aren't enough courts. And there's a perception that no one is using tennis courts. And so there's um, sort of empty space that maybe should be converted. Um, from a parks and rec agency standpoint, our biggest issue is that we receive um, noise complaints um, from pickleball. Those calls go into um, a sister agency, our public health department here in Denver, um, but they're also a regulatory agency. And so when violations are found, um, we're faced with uh, how to bring those courts into compliance with our city's noise ordinance, which is similar to what other cities have found uh, or have in place. So we're not really atypical in that um, regard, but, um, you know, when that happens, we really have to consider whether we close the courts, we limit hours of play, or we find some other solution. And that kind of came to a head uh, for us earlier this year. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so our response is these uh, noise complaints kind of escalated, um, as well as demand grew. And um, we recently had a uh, mayoral election here in Denver, um, as well as a city council election. And so people were, you know, kind of gathering their coalitions and, and trying to advocate for the things that they wanted to see um, as some of the leadership in the city changes. And we decided to create a pickleball advisory board. This is a short-term board. We're not really in the business of kind of creating a lot of different boards for each activity that happens in a park, but we recognize the need to look at, you know, what the needs are for pickleball, what the best practices are, and, and where we could really cite these so that we don't inadvertently put people in a position where they're violating a noise ordinance or creating conflict at a park or in a neighborhood. Um, that group is still meeting, and they are working with us on some of our um, recommendations for where we should put courts in the future and also helping us develop our first design guidelines that go into construction scopes of work um, for pickleball courts. Um, next slide, please. Um, so this is, again, still in progress, but this is the direction we're going in. And I, I thought I'd share, um, I suspect I'm partially on this panel because I reached out to Chuck and said, well, what's Montgomery County doing? And do you know what other people are doing um, to kind of think about appropriate space and locations? And for us, um, you know, we have over 250 parks in Denver in the, the urban area, and some of them are just really not appropriate for something like pickleball, especially if we put a lot of courts together. So um, we found through our testing with our public health department, as well as reports from other acoustical engineering firms, that the ideal distance um, for a setback without any other mitigation is really about 500 to 600 feet from homes. Um, the line of sight is important as well. So if you can see a court from where you are and you're under about 500 feet from that, you're really going to pick up um, that impulsive sound that's coming from pickleball um, that's also at a pitch that's different from other um, uh, activities that can happen in a park. And so that's really where you're starting to get the complaints from people um, is that it's just too loud. And it's really difficult to um, cite these any closer than that because we're not the ones who are managing um, the city noise ordinance on um, decibel levels. So we're looking at saying, if you show up, you should be able to play, you shouldn't be shut down. We also, and I think this is true of Montgomery County and any other parks and rec organization, we don't wanna build courts that are then going to be shut down within a year um, because of the noise. So we closed one of our more famous ones is um, Congress Park here in Denver. Um, that one was only 103 feet from the uh, adjacent homes. And that's really where um, a lot of our problems started. Is it, it was just too close. 
Um, but we're also looking at, in addition to distances, um, what are what are those existing park usages? I mean, a number of our parks we value and treasure open space here in Denver. Um, a lot of those serve key ecological functions and hydrological functions and may not be appropriate to put pervious surface down. Um, but also, as Chuck mentioned, you know, people show up um, driving often. We don't have as good of a public transit system as the DC area does. Um, but they also show up in bigger numbers. Pickleball is just inherently more social than some of the other two people or four people activities that you may go to a park to do. So do we have the type of restrooms and parking that's available? How busy is that park already? And can we think about um, making sure that these are sited in places where people can come in larger groups and maybe reserve a shelter or something like that? Uh, next slide, please. And um, I mentioned that we're trying to come up with some design guidelines design guidelines that are not just simply a tennis conversion and putting down um, some, you know, shared lines or restriping entirely, but really thinking about um, what are those differences between the way people play pickleball and the way people play tennis or other uh, racket sports. And, um, you know, we're really leaning toward um, not precluding that we would ever convert or build shared spaces, but having something that's standalone. I think the numbers are really um, leaning that way, and we hope that people, when they come to one of our parks, if they have an expectation of being able to play tennis or play pickleball, that they can find that. Um, we know that there are some things that are just different about how people sort of organize themselves. So putting in paddle racks, for example, to help facilitate that drop and play and the sharing of court between um, games, but also looking at how people cue for the sport. Um, you know, people come in their larger groups and they bring in their barbecues or their chairs and they, they want a place to go. So we're looking at having appropriate space outside of the entry gates um, where there's a seating and gathering area and, and people are kind of welcome to do that in a place where they're not kind of disrupting either the native landscapes that we have or other sports um, that are going on. And I think the big message from us is that we're open to changing these site selection and design guidelines as the world of pickleball and parks changes. Right now, we're kind of on trend with um, the way the numbers are going, but that may change. Um, and we would love to see uh, some quieter equipment that might um, kind of broaden the parks that we find are appropriate to put this in. But um, that's the kind of trend that we're going on. And I look forward to um, answering any questions during our Q&A session. Great. Thank you, Stacey. Uh, so uh, we'll now open it up for questions. Darren Fluche will be facilitating the Q&A uh, session. So I'm going to invite uh, Darren to join us. I'll leave this slide up, which is the contact information for all the uh, speakers today, including Carl Schmitz, who couldn't join us, but uh, he is always happy to answer questions from people. So feel free to reach out to him with any questions about equipment standards or facility development of pickleball, uh, what the USA Pickleball Association is uh, currently thinking and doing. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Darren Fluche. I'm Division Chief for Park Planning and Stewardship at Montgomery Parks, and I will be facilitating the question and answer today. So we actually extended this uh, park speaker series to 90 minutes, anticipating the um, the high registration levels. And I'm told that we have record registration for, for this event. Um, and we have a number of really good questions. So um, the team here, uh, the parks team and, and panelists have been uh, answering some of the questions uh, in written form. And we're gonna get through as many as we can uh, right now uh, through this discussion. So I appreciate uh, the panelists for their great presentations and the really thoughtful questions that we've already gotten in the um, in in the panel. So folks can yeah pop their their videos back on, and I'm going to go through more or less in order. Um, and there there are some themes that I can kind of package some of the questions together, um, and uh, and we get to some some spicier ones uh, as we go a little bit. So um feel free to uh to continue to, to put questions in and just know that we will get to as many as we can and with that um the very first question we got at at, at minute 107 was 
Um, what is the, and this is maybe a, a Chuck question, what is the budget for uh, Montgomery County's parks and recreation? Doesn't sound like that's necessarily um, pickleball specific, but maybe you can answer that broadly and and um, and as it pertains to pickleball or and or tennis. Well, well, um, I'm afraid to say I don't really know what our agency budget is. I was hoping Mike or you would be You're able right. to answer that question, but uh, I can tell you that we don't have a line item in the budget for pickleball. We do have a line item in our budget for the courts program, of which is divided into tennis improvements, pickleball improvements, basketball improvements, and other, uh, including court soccer now. Um, and so we do have a dedicated line item for that, and it, it varies from year to year. Uh, it's a couple hundred thousand dollars a year, I believe. So I'm, I'm just happy to give some broad numbers. I don't really have isolated numbers for pickleball, but obviously we've been spending quite a bit of capital money over the past uh, four to five years on conversions and, and some uh, purpose-built uh, courts. Uh, the operating budget for Montgomery Parks on an annual basis is just a little over $100 million. That primarily funds our staff and our uh, contractual work and supplies and materials. And then the capital budget over six years uh, for Montgomery Parks is about $250 million. So we're, you know, we're pretty big, pretty well-funded agency, but I would never acknowledge that we have enough money to do everything we need to do. Thanks, Mike. Uh, appreciate that. Um, so this is a question um, that, Stacy, you you started to speak to. Um, this came in before your presentation. Have you, and I think it's for us, but um, anyone can answer. Have you further defined a suitable distance from homes? Um, so Stacey, again, you kind of started to address that. Do you have rules of thumb? And and, and Chuck, do you want to speak to that as well? Stacey. Yeah, um, as I mentioned, it's about 500 to 600 feet away from homes. Um, what we've learned is that you can go under that, um, maybe more like 300 to 350 feet away, if you provide other types of sound mitigation. Um, there are some products out there, um, such as uh, acoustical fencing material, um, those come with other challenges. Um, for Denver, we're pretty windy and those things can act like a, a sail when they are picked up unless there's a pretty heavy duty fence put in. So I think really the message for that is they can be really site specific. So maybe parks that that don't have that challenge are a little easier, but um, everything that we've heard and read from some of the leading uh, national organizations doing sound studies is that the the first line of defense really is that setback and then you can look at some other things you can even kind of move around the orientation of the court we also prefer north south to keep the sun glare out of people's eyes but um, the highest sounds are coming in the direction of play so you do pick up a few decibels um, if uh, the homes are really coming more off of the um, the kitchen area of the pickleball court Thank you. Yeah, and in terms of Montgomery Parks' approach, um, so noise is, is complicated. It's a very subjective issue. Uh, some people can tolerate the pickleball noise and others cannot. But generally, we try to only put pickleball in locations that are at least 300 feet from homes uh, and ideally uh, you know, more than that. Um, a few years ago, I did an informal uh, sound study uh, or noise study at one of our parks. And honestly, what I found um, was that it's not so much the noise level, but it's the newness of the noise. People aren't used to pickleball noise like they are with tennis and basketball. Uh, and it's a different type of sound. It has a different tone and it's more frequent. And the social noise often exceeds the sound of the pickleball paddle hitting the ball. Uh, when, especially when there's large crowds of 10, 15, 20 or more, um, you know, playing at a particular location. Uh, so, you know, I, I'd say it's very subjective, um, but uh, generally our guidelines uh, are that uh, we, we don't want to go below 300 feet. The problem with that that we found is that uh, the locations that can meet that criteria or achieve that criteria are in our suburban and more rural areas. And we're really struggling to find places to add pickleball in our urban areas. So what we're doing in our urban areas is putting tape lines down 
uh, at certain locations as a pilot where people where a com particular community request it and then we're asking for feedback from the community to see uh, how the community is responding to that and often these are locations where people are already playing pickleball putting down their own chalk lines uh, so people the communities are generally used to the sound already uh, but when we, we put down the tape lines um, of course we want to be considered of the the neighbors nearby that are less than 300 feet. But like I said, we're really having a, a challenge uh, finding appropriate locations in our more urban areas. All right, thank you. Um, so uh, Chuck, you can pop your camera back on because uh, this one is also, I think, related. You had mentioned um, the, the word underutilized tennis courts and, and looking at, at court conversion. So um, what constitutes underutilized tennis courts and, and how, how do you benchmark that? Yeah, so we deploy uh, infrared cameras uh, at places where we're uh, looking to convert uh, pickleball courts, uh, tennis courts to pickleball courts. Uh, so we monitor those um, and we put up a camera for several weeks during uh, seasons or times of year when we think uh, the tennis courts and pickleball courts or tennis courts might be used uh, more frequently. And we monitor the use and we figure out how much use is the tennis court getting? Uh, and it depends, of course, by the condition of the court, but generally it's, um, you know, the people are generally pretty uh, flexible in where they play, uh, provided that there's no cracks in the pavement. Uh, so yeah, we put up a camera, we monitor it, and then uh, we make a decision on uh, whether it's appropriate to convert. And like I said before, one of the things that we really try to avoid is removing tennis service from a particular community the example that I gave about Bar Drive, uh, the reason why we chose to move forward quickly with that is because tennis courts were only a few hundred feet away. Thanks, Chuck. Uh, Alex, this is a question for you. Uh, you had showed a slide about increasing participation in sports. Can you also mention any sports that are declining in population, if you have that data? Yeah, we, we do have that data, no problem at all. Um, the sports that have been declining, again, are, are kind of the opposite. So it's the ones that are indoors, uh, the ones you can't socially distance and, and outside. So that would be a lot of uh, health club based uh, activities. So like stationary cycling group, stationary mm -hmm. cycling, um, elliptical use, uh, rowing machine, stuff like that. Um, there's also a bunch of team sports again. So the team sports you can play outside, but team sports have really been affected in terms of the season when the pandemics came in the variants. Uh, and usually they're in, they're in larger groups. So like rugby and lacrosse, um, are also declining in terms of or, or had a decline in terms of a three year change. So it's generally been been team sports and uh, fitness in terms of grouping, but there are outliers in them. So obviously, like we would classify running and jogging and walking for fitness and yoga as a fitness activity. Those obviously all did really well um, during the pandemic. And for team sports, uh, soccer did really well and basketball did really well. So just it is dependent. But generally, those are the categories that that declined. Thanks. And you had you had mentioned some of the uh, the age distribution of pickleball players. Do you have any data on race and ethnicity of sports participation? Yeah, we do. So every single one of our activities can be cut by uh, frequency, gender, age group, geographic region, income level, ethnicity level, and education level. So we have reports online, and I won't go into it now, but but we do have that data. And and do, are there any over uh, kind of general observations about uh, pickleball and and tennis? Um, so the race? the big thing for for pickleball is, and I think uh, David brought this up before, is we do have cross participation statistics um, in terms of how many people are playing what. Um, in twenty twenty two, uh, twenty seven percent of pickleball players also play tennis. So again, that's nationwide. Um, we have we don't cut that out in terms of by region or anything else. So it's just the overall participation. But it was about two point five million people. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, this is a this is a question for for David. Um, what what do you think it would take to develop and spread why wi uh, widespread adoption of quieter paddles and, and or balls? It's a good question. And uh, if Carl were here, I worked with Carl on the uh, sport. Uh, the group with the USTA and USA Pickleball. And uh, there's some paddles that are coming out that are going to be quite a bit quieter. In all my in-person uh, presentations, I pull out a couple of Dell paddles and uh, they have a foam core. They're not legal for pickleball player, but they're not 
too much out of size, but the noise is cut in half. So it really comes down to uh, our national governing body, USA Pickleball, creating a sound spec and forcing the manufacturers to, to adopt them. And it can be done. It's a matter of just technology. There's also balls. They had quiet pickleballs. It was really a rebranded foam kids tennis ball. But uh, some places do use them where they want to play at 7 o'clock in the morning next to a, to a house. So the, it's a combination of, of several things. One, a quieter paddle, quieter ball perhaps. Uh, people around there getting used to the sound of it. Um, and I think as those sort of congeal over the years, we're going to see it improve and improve because it has to because uh, more and more people are playing pickleball and obviously the noise is going to continue to go up. And, uh, you know, Carl said, I think only 1% of all facilities that put in pickleball had lawsuits, but I've countered that with, I bet you there's about 20% of facilities that didn't get pickleball courts because they were worried about the noise that might have had this uh, sound been mitigated a little bit better, more effectively. And I don't, think that putting in very expensive sound barrier things is the long-term solution. I think it's, it's a combination of quieter equipment and you're still going to have larger groups of people, which make more noise. So you have to site selection process is important. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, speaking of infrastructure, uh, there was a, a little bit of back and forth in the question about windscreen. So some of the questions were, can windscreens be added to current and future pickleball courts? Um, and then there was a discussion about um, what kind of, you know, noise mitigating infrastructure, um, you know, actually works, and it, and if there is is any. So it, it, this is a question for Hi Stacey. I see your hand up. So yeah, go ahead and take that one. We have like looked into this so much lately, and have gone to experience it and other things that I can speak a little to a bit about it, and I know David probably can too. Um, what we found is that they're really like several things, right? So there's setbacks and that's really just the distance. Um, and again, the line of sight, if you're going to perceive it louder, if there's a line of sight to something, um, if it's across water, for example, it's going to sound much louder for much longer um, than if it's across land or topography. Um, but the other things that you can do are hanging those like acoustical panels. Um, those really, are probably the most effective in terms of the number of decibels reduction that you can get. However, it requires near complete opacity and fence coverage. So you can have small openings to allow a gate to open, but um, the engineers that we've spoken with really say that you can have about 1% opening in that. And from a park design standpoint, it's really undesirable for us. Um, I just think of, you know, as a, even just a park user, that if I were coming off of a court or wanting to go into a court, I would want to be able to see, you know, who's playing, who's there. When I come out, I'd want to see what I'm walking out into. Um, with buildings, we have windows. Um, but with this, if you put in windows or something, then you're just going to funnel that sound out. And you also find, at least like in our more urban areas where we're starting to build up more and we don't have just single family or two story homes. Um, you have to have that coverage from all of the stories. So we recently had an incident here in Denver where there was a tournament um, that was held at some courts and someone on an adjacent eighth floor was the one calling it. And the, the first and second floor, there were some of these acoustic panels there and, and they didn't really have an issue with the noise, but it was the people living above as the sound kind of carried. Um, and we also found with those that, um, at least here where, um, we do have some cloudy days, but for the most part, it's really sunny and our sun intensity is higher out here. Um, we found that uh, those screens can also make the court pretty hot. Um, mm -hmm. It's already warm. And so um, with player comfort, it may not be the best solution depending on your climate. Um, the other ones you can do, you can build, you know, like a, a concrete block or cement block wall. Um, that's pretty expensive and it would take away, you know, from a budget to actually build courts if you're trying to build these mitigation things. Um, so I, I think really, you know, there are pros and cons to these, but um, I'm a, on a here here for quieter equipment as a industry standard. I'm sure there is some graduate student in material science out there that is looking for a thesis project. And I think this would, it would certainly help us build more courts um, in Denver. 
Thank you, Stacey. That I really appreciate the insight and and the the thoughtfulness which you've been exploring these these issues. And I will say, we uh, my division purchased some of the quieter rackets to to test it out, and it it seemed to my untrained ear to have some impact. Um, so that that could be a promising approach. So it took until the one uh, until the thirty three minute mark, but we got a, a comment that I think sort of crystallizes a lot of the the public discourse around pickleball and and tennis. So I'm just going to read it word for word and and ask everybody to kind of chime in to the extent that they uh, feel comfortable and 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 have something to say. So this is the this is the comment. It remains fundamentally unfair to homeowners and all other park users to allow one group pickleball players to enter a park and annoy every other user of the park with their noise, both the noise from the game and the absurd noise the players make. No other group in the park is granted that much power. Pickleball remains the leading source of complaints at parks departments uh, across the country. So um, well, I'll, I'll be curious to dig into to our uh, customer service data to, to, to confirm that. Uh, ourselves, but I'm curious if anybody wants to reply. This is sort of the philosophical question about introducing a new activity into a park uh, that has some uh, that has some um, unintended consequences. Mike, I see you've pop, popped on and unmuted. Yeah, why, why don't you take this one? Absolutely. I'm really glad that question was asked because, it, you know, this idea of uh, a facility or amenity that serves a lot of people, that a lot of people are interested in, that who want to utilize it in a park um, uh, is a very good thing for a lot of reasons. It's 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 physical activity and physical fitness. It's fun. It's socialization. All kinds of good things happen. But it's not unique to pickleball that you can have unintended consequences. And it's very common in the park world that we have to deal with this. Dog parks is a great example. A lot of very similar things do you believe in montgomery county maryland more there are more families more households that are dog owners than there are households that have school-age children in montgomery so we have a lot of people uh, and uh, the, the the development here pattern is uh mostly multi-family now so you have a lot of people with dogs that don't have backyards but the same thing dogs barking and proximity to other facilities um, we did an open parkways program that was extremely popular during the pandemic. We closed down seven miles of what were park roads to automobiles on the weekends. Thousands of users per day, but in some cases we had an unintended consequence of cut through traffic in neighborhoods when those roads were closed. So my point is that, um, you know, pickleball isn't bad. Pickleball is good. Um, this is, you know, it, it, but we need to be conscious in thinking through how to minimize and mitigate any, any unintended consequences, particularly related to the noise issue. Thanks, Mike. I think that that was well said, Mike. So maybe we, we, we can leave it at that. Um, David, I'm going to, uh, uh, paddle this one over to you. Um, as an avid uh, USTA recreational tennis player, um, all I ask is that some courts are designated as only tennis. Um, and um, and part of this discussion, I won't read the whole comment because it's fairly long, but part of the discussion is about confusion over the lines. Um, I think sh you know sharing and competing for time on the courts, um, but just asking that while we um, try to uh, improve or increase our supply of some pickleball only, courts that we also ensure that there are some designated only for for tennis as well so david go ahead with that and then and then chuck you can uh jump in after i totally agree there needs to be totally dedicated tennis courts and i think as you get to certain facilities that will be the case now they may have pickleball as well but just on the other side of the building where it's uh not going to conflict but actually complement perhaps the families that come with some of them playing tennis some are playing pickleball um Regarding the lines, we actually had specific meetings about that, and I've done a lot of presentation on the two sets of lines, making it challenging for one sport or the other to uh, make those line calls, as you heard from my commentary on the yellow lines being an issue. Uh, if the lines are too close to each other, the real problem that we saw at the tennis courts with the traditional two-on-one uh, parallel nets is the tennis service lines being a little too close. We looked at it from seven feet, six feet, Eight feet, eight feet's a little more. Seven feet 
is the blend that we're using in Montgomery County and Fairfax County is using. And six feet was a, interesting because it shared a line. And a lot of facilities that put up temporary, you know, with uh, tape or painting, decided to use some of the tennis lines as a shared pickleball line. But we came up with one sort of decision in the group that there should be at least six inches of separation from any tennis and pickleball line. And you can get used to it. I mean, I played, uh, when I played high school tennis, uh, you know, we had those indoor gyms and we get rained out of the outdoor tennis. We play our matches in this gym and it had 72 sports going down there. And you can actually get used to it after a while, but it is, it does degrade the single sport user experience. And so the more that we can have uh, dedicated courts for both pickleball and tennis and to give them separation from uh, other sports that might create noise. I mean, I have pro tennis programs that run on park and school courts that are right next to these ball fields. And that's louder than sometimes than any pickleball game I've heard. Trust me on that. And the dog parks are right there as well. So I think some of this is learning how to get along better. Some of it's in the design. But I totally agree with having, you know, dedicated tennis courts, dedicated pickleball courts. And in facilities that are managed, they can uh, set it up when they have to be shared to partition it. Pro like at the club that I'm at, there's no pickleball from 7 to 9 a.m. on the far court because it's the closest to the houses on the weekends. And so and we have a pickleball drop in on a Saturday and Sunday. It's the tennis uh, drop in. So I think those are all collectively part of the, the solution. But there is no perfect answer that will be fixed in the next few years. It's going to take more time than that. Is that it? They answer that pretty well. Thank you. Yeah. Chuck, did you want to did you want to add anything? Yeah, I did. I meant to mention earlier uh, in my presentation or, or my uh, introductory remarks, we do have two parks in Montgomery County uh, where we have tennis courts that we don't currently have plans to add pickleball. Uh, only, Ma only Manor Recreational Park uh, in our eastern and central part of the county, we have 18 tennis courts, some of which are soon to be renovated. Uh, that will remain, at least for now, uh, tennis only. Um, because that is a location that is uh, um, permitted often for uh, tennis tournaments. And then Cabin John Regional Park in our lower western part of the county, there are nine tennis courts and also a place where we currently don't have plans uh, to add pickleball. Uh, I'll also say that um, I was the project coordinator for the Wheaton Regional Park Master Plan. There are um, six outdoor tennis courts uh, at Wheaton Regional Park currently. We are gonna convert a few of them to pickleball, but we are gonna retain several uh, for tennis only. So I just wanted to point that out, that we are trying to strike the right balance in, in our approach to pickleball and tennis in Montgomery County. Uh, and we do have two locations where we're currently not planning pickleball. Thanks Chuck. Somebody, um... Uh, somebody down in the comments talked about Turkey Thicket in Washington, D.C. as a good example of a, a co-location of independent pickleball and independent uh, tennis. And I think that is a good a good model. Um, Alex, this one is for you. This is a question that I had as well when you were showing the uh, the, the sports participation increase chart. Um, do you have any information on disc golf? Um, good question. Or, yeah, so currently disc golf is not one of the 124 sports or activities that we track. Uh, I am looking to add disc golf either this year or next year. We have some criteria in terms of when we can track a sport because obviously if we it's, we can't just keep adding sports because it just makes the survey incredibly long. So um, there's a certain criteria that needs to go in, but disc golf is on our radar and we would look to get in our numbers in, in, in the near future. Great, appreciate that. Um, so I think we, we covered the... Um... The confusion, the lines. There was some discussion in the in the comments about about that. Um, so uh, I'll just read this one. Uh, we we have heard this is a, a colleague from uh, Prince, our neighboring uh, county, Prince George's County, that they have heard from the tennis community that people don't often play pickup, quote unquote, pickup tennis. That the desire is for four to eight courts in one location for classes and tournament play. Can you speak to that in relation to pickleball use and, and court planning? The the desire for uh, concentration of courts, in, including uh, tennis courts for, for larger scale activities. Well, I can, I can take the question about permitting. Uh, we're currently not yet allowing permitting of 
pickleball courts. Uh, we did debate it and consider it for a while. We just don't have a, enough inventory of pickleball courts to, to make it fair to, to all the users, particularly the people who are uh, traveling long distance for pickup play. Uh, but at some point, we will revisit it and uh, and allow uh, pickleball courts to be permitted uh, on Montgomery County Parkland. Uh, as I stated in my uh, in introductory re remarks, we are going to have about 20 more dedicated courts uh, in the next few years. And I think once those are online, uh, that's when we'll probably rethink the, the permitting policy. Yeah, thank you. Um we had a question about our, um, I think it's specifically in Montgomery County, Chuck, uh, about calculating um, level of service and and demand, uh, asking whether or not we take into account uh, the many more private companies that are opening indoor pickleball courts in Montgomery County. YMCA, Bethesda One Life, for example, are are offering pickleball events in their facilities, and Dill Dinkers are opening multiple pickleball facilities in Rockville, for example. Yeah, I think it's outstanding that the private sector is stepping up to provide more uh, indoor pickleball courts. I think that takes the pressure off of Montgomery Parks and other providers that uh, like uh, the tennis plex up in Germantown uh, to provide that. Uh, they're all fee based, whether it's a public private partnership or the private sector. I think it's wonderful uh, that there are providers of indoor pickleball. Uh, it also takes pressure off of Montgomery Parks having to provide uh, lighting uh, for our outdoor pickleball courts because people will have an option uh, to play indoors uh, elsewhere in the county at one of these private facilities. So I think it's great that it, uh, the private sector is stepping up. Great, thanks. Um, so there was a, there was another question, uh, David, about uh, about equipment. Can we talk more about quieter equipment options? Mm. No. It's really, again, uh, as I mentioned earlier, about uh, the companies making quieter paddles. I did see a comment in okay. the box about uh, I, somebody mentioned that I know people that won't play with quieter paddles, even if they're available and they're not expensive. And I don't think there's anything wrong with using a noisier paddle if you're in a place that it's not a problem. Mm -hmm. But I think we have to be respectful of people around us at all times you know, sort of regardless of what we're really doing. I, I mean, I have, I go to the park courts and school courts and they're covered with leaves. I've got a battery leaf blower. I've got a gas blower. And, uh, you know, I try to, it might be Saturday morning. I have to be careful which one I choose to use and how powerful I do it. But I've got to get the courts cleared for the programs when, when we're there. I think that's just, it's some common sense. I think the industry needs to step up a bit. There are communities that have created green lists which is a list of paddles they've tested for noise uh, that they approve in their community. Now, an HOA can try to enforce things like that. Some of those things are harder to enforce than others. But, I mean, could you take this from the leaf blower position and, and say, you know, a paddle and a ball intersecting with the ball coming at this velocity and the paddle coming at this velocity makes this level of decibels, you know, at 50 feet from that. I mean, you, theoretically, you could come up with that, but if we can just – you know, get a better grip on the common sense of this. I think that sort of answers it in itself. And if you're going to be in a place with the, where there's large groups, uh, it should be separated from the housing. And there are people who have bought houses right next to a park. And that's part of what happens when you live next to a park. <laughs> you know, there's things going on. There's events that happen. And uh, and that might be a desirable thing for your for your home being that close, but it's also got you know, the, the downside to it. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm trying to kind of scan for, for new topics that we haven't covered yet since we're in the home stretch here, four minutes left. One, uh, Mike, I wonder if, if you'd be interested in this one. Somebody asked about, are you know, looking historically, are there any other uh, times over, over history that we've seen an issue uh, like this before? Two very passionate groups with competing opinions and the professionals in the field trying to balance the needs of their community. So any, anybody have any any analogs to this that we can learn from? Well, I, I, I love that question. I'm just so glad it's asked. One of the things about uh, this discussion that makes me proud to be a park and recreation professional is people might think everything we do is easy and fun. And this shows that everything is complicated. Um, 
uh, and a lot of things have different points of views. And, you know, for those of us who work in public service, it's our job to try to find the sweet spot. And I think that's a big theme of this conversation here is we want to promote something that's good and healthy for the community, but not alienate people by creating unintended consequences. I do, you know, personally align myself with a comment kind of David made, though. We, we do always want to be good neighbors. But on the other hand, if you own a property adjacent to a park, you really ought to expect people to be in the park, recreating, socializing, and enjoying, uh, you know, their, their time there. Uh, I live a block and a half from a park. Um, uh, I, I hear soccer whistles and cheers on Saturday morning when I go get my newspaper. I happen to love it. You know, it, it, it's a nice thing. But um, so, you know, I, I won't go into, you know, I cited some other things that fall in that category. Trails, one of the most popular facilities that we've built during my tenure at Park is paved trails. And the new ones uh, that we've tried to build in the past few decades People who live along the alignment don't always want it. They come out and say, well, you know, there was a quiet Stream Valley Park behind my house for years. Now you're going to build a trail. You're going to put people there. You're going to connect neighborhoods that maybe I don't want my neighborhood connected to. So, uh, you know, this is this is what we do. This is we try to find the sweet spot in the middle where we can serve the people uh, and try to uh, deal with people's uh, fears or consequences of a lot of people using our parks and our facilities. Thank you. I think I think I'm going to sneak one more in here, and it's it's a question um, uh, about. I'm zeroing in on the word in, engagement here, but I'm going to I'm going to read the question. So to our esteemed panelists, as we discuss the challenges of balancing the growing demands for pickleball and tennis facilities in public parks, we're curious about the role the pickleball community. Uh, can play directly in addressing this issue. Uh, could you share any insights or strategy regarding how communities can actively engage end users in funding initi initiatives to meet these demands? Um, and are there successful examples or innovative approaches you've come across in your experiences or research that involve the pickleball community in directly uh, funding and supporting these facilities? And I'm going to amend uh, this question a little bit and ask about ways that the pickleball community, the tennis community, and parks departments can engage with neighbors in the communities to mitigate some of these concerns and uh, find the optimum uh, outcome for everybody. So, because we haven't really talked about uh, public engagement too much and engaging with neighbors as part of a dialogue, um, as opposed to doing something and dealing with the the, the kind of the reaction. So, could, can anybody, Stacy, have you had any experience? Uh, you, you you showed some news clippings about some of the uh, the spicy reaction that you've gotten, but have you uh, um, integrated any of that feedback into the way you do engagement and communication for future projects? Yeah, we um, certainly, depending on the project and the size or scope, we typically put together um, either a steering committee or a technical advisory committee for our projects. And so um, for something like you know, inclusion of pickleball courts, we would invite people to be part of that community, that group, whether that's a technical committee or otherwise, um, to be, you know, from the pickleball community or experts, we would probably look at USA Pickleball um, for maybe a local represent, representation for that. Um, but we typically do a lot of work with, you know, immediate residents. And this one is interesting because it's, you know, kind of coming from immediate residents uh, and neighbors of a park with noise complaints. Um, and some of these are happening at regional parks where we think more like citywide facilities. So um, it is kind of changing our thoughts about um, how people participate and who participates um, so that we can really kind of suss out conflict and not just the, you know, what would you like to see in the park that's closest to your home? Okay. Well, thank you very much. We we've extended our to our ninety minutes. Uh, this has been a really, I think, productive and interesting uh, conversation. So I just want to thank everybody for all of our panelists and um, all of the the listeners and participants in the the question answer um, period um, for participating in our September speaker series. Our next session will take place on Tuesday, October seventeenth at one p.m. Eastern. Um, the topic will be birding 
and how the popular pastime can be made more inclusive for people with disabilities and other health concerns. So we look forward to, to that uh, again, Tuesday, October 17th at 1 p.m. And with that, I want to thank everybody for participating in this discussion and for our panelists uh, and for, for Mike and Chuck from Parks. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone.